he brought his show on the road, literally right here to William & Mary. I had the chance to talk to CNN's John King about 2012 politics and his visit to William & Mary. How have you liked William & Mary so far, your visit? We're having fun. We just talked to Chancellor Gates. Uh, he's having a great first day on the job. And uh, just look around. I mean, we're in front of the beautiful Wren, and it's a gorgeous campus. And uh, I'm just thrilled to be here. It's part of history. It's also you know, it's newsworthy uh, to talk to the new chancellor here, former defense secretary. And it's great to get out of the office and be in such a historic, beautiful place. I'm excited. Well, we appreciate you being yeah. here. So you started out as a journalist at the AP, am I, I correct? Um, and so since you worked at the AP, now you've worked your way up the ladder at CNN. How has broadcast journalism changed, especially with social media like Twitter and Facebook? I started as a print guy. So when I switched to broadcast journalism, it was a pretty big transition. That was 14 years ago. And then in that 14 years, cable television has changed dramatically. Uh, we're HD now. There's no tape anymore. It's all discs. It's all computerized and digitized. Uh, then you have the explosion of social media, whether it be the Twitter and Facebook, things like that, or just blogs and people. And look, some of that, some of pe some people who consider themselves to be media, uh, don't follow the same rules I do. Um, check your sources. Try to be objective. But that's okay. It's a First Amendment. In a First Amendment. That's why this country was founded, and we're Williamsburg of all places, where they debated such things, you know, back at the beginning uh, when we had a king. Um, and so people fought and died for the First Amendment. So it'd be pretty arrogant for anyone to say, well, they don't practice it the way I want it practiced. Uh, it's for everybody, and people have different rules. And I trust in the common sense of the consumer, the viewer, the reader, the listener, to essentially figure out that person knows what they're talking about. That person might be very smart, but they're partisan. Maybe they're conservative, maybe they're liberal. And I want to read them because they're interesting, but if I want to go for objective news, I'm going to go, whether it's to John King and CNN or you know, ABC or CBS, wherever they choose, the local newspaper, the local station. Common sense, people will figure it out. So there's a great thirst for information, and people can now get it because of technology in thousands, if not millions of ways. What is something that viewers would be surprised by um, about the behind-the-scenes workings of John King USA. <laughs> what would they be surprised by? Um, well, sometimes they see it on live television, but you know, the, the, putting this all together, the, how you make the sausage part of television, mm -hmm. is logistically hard. Uh, if you go inside there and you see it over here a few steps away, uh, the people at the camera, the people who are then editing pieces, the people there are a lot of people who don't get credit mm -hmm. in television, and you know the guy on TV or the girl on TV has the, the name, they're the talent, whatever they call it. Um, well, that's great and it's flattering, uh, but there there are a lot of pieces to it. Mm -hmm. um, what else behind the scene? I drink too much coffee during <laughs> the day. Uh, we very much believe at the end of the day of finding a local place to celebrate. Um, occasionally, there's a cold adult beverage involved. Um, and the, the gift, I mean, I'm joking, but I'm not joking. And the gift of my job now is that I view this as the curiosity business, mm -hmm. and I get paid to learn. Um, and I borrowed a lot of money and spent a lot of money when I was in college. Uh, now I get paid to learn. And I travel the country, and I've been lucky to travel the world. And so everywhere we go, we try, no matter how busy we are, find something local to see and soak it in. Maybe it's a diner. Maybe it's a conversation with local people. Maybe it's just a walk. Uh, maybe on a place like this, just walk and see the architecture. Uh, I'm a bit of a geek like that, a tourist geek, you might say. Well, uh, are, have you found a place for tonight after the show to go with your with your staff? Are you going to be that here? That's top or? secret research. That's top. <laughs> that's top secret research. Okay. Right? All right. Um, now we're going to go across the street. Maybe Thomas Jefferson can make us, you know, a, a pre-colonial cocktail or something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. I think we'll we'll move on from there. I just okay. have a quick question about 2012 politics because what? you're at the forefront of Fun. reporting on, on 2012. I'm, I'm quite jealous of you. Um, what is something that has surprised you most about the 2012 election so far? The most interesting, I don't know if it's surprising, but mm -hmm. the most interesting thing to me is you have a tug of war um, for the soul of the Republican Party. You have an more traditional establishment Republicans uh, represented to a degree by Governor Romney, who George H. W. Bush, George W. Bush, Bob Dole, John McCain, uh, conservative but pragmatic. They think it's their party. 
And then you have this relatively new, and you had some of this in Virginia in 2010, a Tea Party, people who were disenchanted. Maybe they voted for Ross Perot back in the 1990s. They became disaffected. They didn't think politics mattered to them. Then they came back in 2010 because of their concerns about federal spending and the size of government. And they were, yes, mad at Obama, but just as mad at the Republicans for spending all that money. So you have this new sort of raw energy in the party competing against the older establishment in the party. And it's a fierce tug of war. You see it playing out state by state. Iowa, Santorum. New Hampshire, Romney, South Carolina, Gingrich, Florida, Romney. Now we're on to Nevada and beyond. Uh, it's in many ways a good thing. The party doesn't have a national leader, so it's in this soul searching, and it's a struggle and a tug of war. It's fun to watch. It's kind of messy sometimes. Uh, and But it's about something. It's become personal. Gingrich and Romney aren't getting along right now, so they're using a lot of personal, don't trust, dishonest, those kind of words. Uh, but if you look beneath that at the policy, it's actually about something and about the role of government and the role and the future of the conservative movement. So it's fun. I'm a, again, I'm a geek. I'm an organizing person. What, uh, politics to me is not about Democrats, Republicans, or independents. It's about what motivates people of any ideology to organize and get together, especially because people are so busy now. Mm -hmm. Many people have two jobs. People are trying to raise their kids. They're juggling all the things in their lives. So to get somebody to get actively involved in politics takes a passion and a commitment. So that's more what I focus on than any names of any candidates. No disrespect to any of the candidates or the current president of the United States for that matter. What I'm much more interested in is what makes people so passionate that they, at a time they're so busy and so stressed in their lives, they would give time to volunteer, give time to come to a rally, give time to email their friends and try to organize them. That's what I watch for because they often then learn about cutting edge issues that way before they get debated in Washington are happening out at state and local levels. Maybe it's schools, maybe it's taxes, mm -hmm. maybe it's the environment. Uh, but that's how you find you when you watch what is motivating people to organize uh, you find out where the energy is in politics and that was the big surprise of the Tea Party movement mm -hmm. it just boom out of nowhere because we weren't paying attention so that's what I always look for is there something else that's gonna come boom out of nowhere and get us in 2012 absolutely now one last question um, you have hosted some CNN debates including one recently wow. and uh, you started off the debate by inter uh, asking Newt Gingrich what? about his uh, personal life and it made headlines and I know right afterwards I was watching and and you said you expected that response from him mm -hmm. um, what advice can you give to young journalists about how to decide what questions to ask and how to have thick skin like you said. well you need to have thick skin if you want to do this for a living you have to take your lumps mm -hmm. you have to also realize that um, the unfortunate part of that is that I became part of the story for a few days that's not my job mm -hmm. my job is to navigate and moderate a debate is to play traffic cop uh, we wrestled with whether that was a relevant question, and we decided in the end it was. It, his ex-wife had come forward on that very day the interview was released and raised some pretty provocative charges. Mm -hmm. uh, so we decided it was a relevant news question. So you asked the question. Mm -hmm. um, he came at me pretty strong. Mm -hmm. That's his right. He's a politician. I took no offense. I had my job to do. He had his job to do. It's not personal. Um, it was a tactic and a strategy. I get it. Um, on my part is to remember, I'm not there to debate him. There are some people who said, why didn't I go back and forth with him? It's not my job. There were three other candidates up there. It was their debate. I thought it was a fair question and a relevant question. I still believe that today as much as I did when I asked it. I, I respect the debate about that. Don't get me wrong. There are some people who say it shouldn't have been a question at all. There are others who say it shouldn't have been a question in a debate or shouldn't have been the first question in a debate. Again, I, I respect that. That's a conversation worth having, and journalism classes can debate that going forward. I've done, been doing this for 26 years. I had a great team of people working with me. That was the decision we made, and I stand by it. But you have to understand, sometimes they're going to attack you. Um, sometimes you're going to get into the middle of it. You have to decide, what is your question? Ask your follow-up if you have one, and then move on. Uh, and, and accept the fact that you may get criticized. Mm -hmm. And study the criticism. Listen to it. Listen to it. We want people to watch. We want people to listen. Uh, there are consumers. So listen to it. You might learn something from it. You might say, I didn't ask some question exactly right, or I could have done this better that way, or I didn't cover that story right. Maybe there was a third or a fourth or a fifth voice that I didn't bring into the conversation on some story you're covering. So if it's constructive criticism, we should listen to it. We should learn from it. And I get a lot of emails from people. Some of them are, many of them are very favorable. Some of them are not. I try to reply to them. Thank you for your input. I disagree or I don't quite see it that way, but I appreciate your watching and, and I appreciate your opinion because you'll learn from it. We're part of it. You mentioned the technology earlier. It used to be the guy or the woman behind the desk 
you know, this is the news today, listen to me. Uh, you can't do that anymore. It's much more of a conversation because of the interactive nature of technology. And so if you want the people on the other end to respect you and to listen to you, then you have to listen to them too. It comes with the territory. It actually makes it fascinating and you learn more by listening to even people who think you're wrong or, you, or you're not exactly right. There are whole ranges of criticism or observation. Some of the observations aren't critical at all. I get a lot of people telling me speak more slowly. I talk too quickly on television. Uh, things like that. So you have to listen to it and process it. And you learn. It's just like going to school. You learn. Well, thank you so much for uh, giving WMTV and the greater William & Mary community some of your time. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. It. Don't thank be silly. You. Good luck. Thank you so much. All right. You can have my job starting at 559. <laughs> I'm out of here. Thank you. <laughs>